Welcome to this, uh, this evening's Canberra Times ANU Meet the Author event. I'm Gia Meverell, the creator of the Canberra Times. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening the former Minister for Finance and member for Melbourne, Liz Tanner, who retired last year after a long and distinguished career. He'll be talking about his new book, Sideshow, Dumbing Down Democracy, an analysis of the malaise, as he sees it, that is afflicting the media, um, the way media reports politics in this country, and the way politicians behave in response, resulting in what he calls the sideshow syndrome. <clears throat> Before inviting Lindsay Tanner to the podium, could I give thanks to his publisher, Scribe, for bringing him to Canberra, and also to Danny News, Colin Steele, and Catherine Pierce for the <coughs> organisation of tonight's event. I mentioned too that bookings will soon open for another free event on August 18 with journalist Paul Daly and photographer Mike Bowers to talk about their new book, Armageddon, Two Men on an Anzac Trail. Before we start, please turn off your mobile phones. There will be time for questions and answers after Lindsay Tanner's talk. And Andrew Lee, the federal member for Fraser and former ASU academic, will give the vote of thanks. Sure. Book signings will follow. And please allow Lindsay Tanner to get to the signing table in the foyer. There's a rather tight schedule tonight, uh, rather than hijacking him on his way there. <laughs> now, um, I'd like to welcome Lindsay Tanner to talk to you all. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks very much uh, to ANU and the Canberra Times, to Colin and uh, my old man Andrew Lee, who I was uh, delighted to see be elected to the Federal Parliament. And thanks very much to you for coming along tonight and demonstrating, I hope, that, like me, you care about issues. You care about the future of Australia and how our political system works and how government and politics should be dealt with in the public domain. My book, Sideshow, is really something that's been incubating in me for a number of years. In fact, I started collecting material for it before we got elected to government in 2007. And so I spent several years just idly cutting things out of newspapers and noting things down and occasionally reading the odd obscure academic textbook about the media and so forth, knowing that I couldn't realistically ever write a book while I was Minister of Finance. I suspect I would have been roundly criticised for doing so. And of course, the very people who were the judge and jury about my performance were also the primary target of my criticism, so it would have been a career-threatening move. You know, like, so. uh, and people rightly would have described me as whinging about the umpire. So it was kind of unavoidable that I had to wait. And as it turned out, the 2010 election campaign, uh, in effect, became, I think, something of a crescendo in this continuing story of public disillusionment with Australian politics. So it, it actually was something of a happy coincidence, albeit uh, not for the rest of the country. Because I don't think there's any doubt that there is more disillusionment in Australia now with politics, the political process, and how politicians conduct themselves than there has been certainly in my adult lifetime. I started out active in politics as a teenager when I moved to Melbourne from East Gippsland to go to university in the mid-70s. And I've been active in all kinds of different things prior to becoming a Member of Parliament. So I've had a long involvement at various levels in the political process. I cannot remember a time when disillusionment with politics has been so extreme. We've all heard about spin, about politicians refusing to answer questions, about politicians using scripts endlessly to avoid answering questions, politicians behaving like robots, gimmicks and stunts, my favourite new noun, the announceable. I hope most of you have heard of what, uh, the announceable. Uh, we used to get rung up and asked, uh, you know, have you got any announceables for the Sunday papers uh, this weekend? And my splenetic response to my staff when I was told this was, I'm the finance minister, I'm supposed to stop announceables. I'm not going to give you announceables. So all of that is not news. But what I've tried to do is to actually ask why. Why are these things happening? What's different now from 20 years ago? And I think the critical difference is the behaviour of the media. 
politicians by and large from gen one generation to the next are uh, you know, not that different. They're, they're pretty much the same as everybody else. They respond to signals saying do this and you'll be rewarded and they try <coughs> and avoid doing things that they think will be punished. So they're trying to compete, they're trying to advance their careers, they're trying to pursue objectives and the playing field they inhabit heavily influences and ultimately controls how they behave. My basic argument is that the media now more than ever before distort, trivialise, personalise the content of political reporting to a point where in some instances it is so far removed from the truth that it is almost laughable. Now obviously it's a mixed picture out there, it's a nuanced picture and there are some areas of good reporting the ABC and SBS, because they're not subject to the same commercial pressures, still by and large have a pretty good quality track record, but they are by no means immune from these problems. Politics is reported as a sporting contest. Who's up, who's down, opinion polls, machinations, manoeuvrings. We have had eight opposition leaders in Australia in ten years. Kim Beasley twice and six others. That is not an accident. It is a direct consequence of the way that political reporting focuses on the endless little personal contests to the exclusion of issues. So more and more, the totality of the content that is delivered by our media is about everything but the actual issues, everything but the content of the matters that are being debated or considered to the extent where, in my view, some sections of the media have almost become unaware of this phenomenon. So it's, it's almost got to the point where they're not making a conscious choice and saying to themselves, issues are boring, people won't buy our newspaper, people won't watch our TV show if we talk about issues. It's almost to the point where they have ceased to understand how to report about the content of issues. Now, there is no single bad guy here, there's no person who's, or, or organisation, or politician, or editor, or producer, or group of people who you can pinpoint blame on. This is a collective phenomenon, because what happens is that politicians respond to the signals they get from the media. The media are the oxygen of politicians. There is only one thing that is absolutely guaranteed to ensure that you will not get elected to something. Yes, being an axe murderer is a disadvantage, <laughs> but it's not absolutely fatal necessarily, at least not for the axe murderer. <laughs> the one thing that will guarantee you won't get elected is if nobody knows who you are. That is the one thing that will guarantee you won't get elected. And how do people know who you are? How did the people in my electorate know who I was? All 100,000 of them? Did I meet them personally? Well, most of them know. Every now and then I'd, I used to do a lot of door knocking and I'd knock on somebody's door and they'd say, you've been in Parliament for 10 years, how come it took you so long to get around here? And I gave them a, a brief lesson in maths as to uh, why this was somewhat difficult and uh, I actually had other parts of the role to do other than just knock on people's doors. So the media are central. They are central to the proper functioning of democracy. And without them, nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows who politicians are, what they are saying, what they stand for, what they're proposing, what they're against. And therefore, it is absolutely central for political success to be in the media. And that is why most politicians will do almost anything to get media coverage. Because without it, you die. Without it, you do not exist. So, that's why this notion that somehow the media are the messenger and that we shouldn't shoot the messenger is complete garbage. They script the message. They decide what is actually going to be broadcast and what isn't. They decide what is going into the newspapers and what isn't. One of my favourite little snippets that I cite in the book <coughs> is a suitably pompous editorial from The Age in 2009 taking Kevin Rudd to task for intervening in the phony dispute between Gordon Ramsay and Tracy Grimshaw of Channel 9 fame, which some of you may recall, where there was a, a bit of name calling and stuff in public and 
course, suitably whipped up by Channel 9 to increase their ratings. And The Age took Kevin Wright to task for making comments about this. What he failed to point out is that it's not Kevin Rudd who decides whether or not these comments get reported. It's actually the editor of The Age. So, of course, The Age did report the comments. And lots of other things were happening that they chose not to report. So, these organisations appear to be almost unaware of the power that they exercise. They are the people who determine what conduct, what statements, what behaviour, what contributions from our politicians are broadcast, broadcast to the wider community. They are the ones who make the choices. And yes, politicians do influence that to some degree. There's no question that they are not passive participants in this process. But they are very much at the mercy of the media most of the time. And that's why you get the situation which you've now got. So why does spin exist? Spin is a defensive reaction by politicians to gotcha journalism. Spin is a phenomenon that has emerged as a protective device. It really first emerged in the UK in response to the most off-the-planet media in the world, like the London Sun, uh, which is literally there to try and tear people apart as entertainment because that apparently sells newspapers. Spin emerged as a defensive reaction to that kind of, uh, kind of behaviour. Refusal to answer questions. If you know that, no, uh, that what, what you say is susceptible to being completely grotesquely distorted and misrepresented and made to mean the opposite of what it's intended to mean and then broadcast to a much wider audience, why wouldn't you be nervous about answering a question? So there is this kind of awful symbiosis here between politicians and the media where the losers are everybody else because you get more boring content, ironically, because everybody's talking about nothing, you get less discussion about serious issues that are actually of concern to people, and of course, you get the politicians no longer being able to convey a serious message to much of the community. Although, as I said, there are exceptions, and this is not some kind of absolute thing I'm referring to, it is a trend. And I think it's got particularly bad over the last decade or so, and I think the federal election last year was probably the most extreme example of it. And we end up with things like moving forward and standing up for Australia. Well, I'm really pleased to hear that we're moving forward. And uh, I'm glad I didn't vote for those people out there who are proposing to move backward. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't vote for the people who are proposing to stand up for some other country, uh, given that I am Australia. Now, of course, these slogans are totally meaningless, but that's where the syndrome is driving us, into a refusal to seriously engage with the content of issues. Now, I am as vigorous an opponent of work choices as anybody in the Labor Party. I was a, a former union secretary of a union that represented mostly lower paid workers with not much industrial muscle who depended and still do depend very heavily on the safety net, the award system, all those kind of things. But I think it's ludicrous that Tony Abbott was put in a position at the start of the election campaign last year where in order to avoid his position mis being misrepresented about any agenda to bring back work choices, he had to promise not to change a single line of any industrial relations laws or regulations for the next three years. So, in other words, if somebody suggests that maybe the, the filing deadline for certain documents at the registrar should be moved from 30 days to 45 days because people are having problems for legitimate reasons, well, no, no, sorry, we can't do that. We promised faithfully not to do that. That's ludicrous, but that's effectively where this mad kind of gotcha journalism ultimately drives you. People are constantly being asked to guarantee things, to rule things out. Uh, extreme scenarios are put to them and they have to then say, well, uh, I'm going to guarantee that that will never happen and therefore distort the positioning of what they're seeking to do. All in order to avoid reporting that, in effect, 
will convey an impression of them doing the opposite of what they're proposing to do. You might recall the debate about the resource super profits tax and the question being asked, well, why didn't the government, when it received the Henry report, put it out in public and say, look, we're thinking about having some kind of resource super profits tax. We're now going to consult with the mining industry and various other people about that and have a big discussion about the content of that. Well, here's what would have happened. The moment we did that, we would have ended up in exactly the same position in the public domain as we were in when we announced here we're doing it. Why? Because the failure to rule out that proposal instantly would have been treated by the media as an announcement that you're going to do it. Literally, that's what would have happened. And so uh, worthy and worthwhile as consultation uh, on an issue like that or other things is, we shouldn't be naive about the notion that somehow these things can happen in a, some kind of unencumbered, reasonable way. That's part of the problem. They can't. It is, becomes very difficult to actually have a serious public conversation about an issue without constantly being forced to rule things out and to duck and weave and to knock off particular propositions, even if you've got no intention of proceeding with them, but it's worthwhile having things there to have a <coughs> discussion, you've, you've almost got to go to the end game straight away. Now, I want to give a few examples that I cite in the book just for the purposes of illustration of how this problem has evolved. I found it amazing that in the wake of the Queensland floods, the most substantial amount of media coverage was about the question of Anna Bly crying and Julia Gillard not crying. Now, believe it or not, I have been a flood victim many, many years ago when I was a kid. My family in a rented, uh, rented house uh, lost its home to flood. Um, now, my memory's a bit hazy, but I don't remember asking myself which politicians out there are feeling my pain or you know, who's crying. I, I think people are actually more interested in what governments are going to do rather than who's sort of feeling their pain. But of course the feel their pain sort of Oprah Winfrey show routine uh, kind of is okay for media presentation. So the end result is you have bizarre things like a big feature article in The Australian saying that Anna Bly has set a new world gold standard in disaster response. <laughs> um, now, I'm a big fan of Anna's and uh, so this is not any criticism of her and I'm sure she would probably privately share my view. But the bizarre thing about this article was it wasn't about the decisions that she and the Queensland Government had taken to deal with the floods. It was about her press conferences and how well that, uh, that had been handled. As if the actual reality of helping people who in many instances of lot have had their lives seriously disrupted, in some cases people died, as if the reality of helping people and recovering from the floods and fixing up the economy is kind of a secondary consideration. And that's an illustration of the problem, is that the performance that appearances are taking over from content. And so the one liner I use in the book to describe this is that Australian politics is now becoming like a Hollywood blockbuster. All special effects and no plot. And that is where primarily the media, but with politicians responding, that is where we're heading. Now, a couple of other examples. Uh, you might uh, occasionally see the magazine The Good Weekend that is attached to the Saturday uh, Herald and Page. And every now and then they do a big profile of a senior politician, you know, a big photo on the front, whatever. And beginning of last year, Barnaby Joyce was briefly Shadow Finance Minister, you might recall. Um, <laughs> I had five shadow finance ministers while I was in office. I'm claiming this as an Australian record. <laughs> One term, five shadow finance ministers. Um, but Barnaby uh, was, uh, being the sub was the subject of one of these profiles and we were there doing Q&A and in the green room beforehand all these people milling around. And I didn't know any of this at the time, uh, but my media advisor was talking to the journalist who was doing this profile. Uh, and she was asking, you know, has it got any good gossip or, you know, does Lindsay want to say anything about Barnaby, etc., etc.? And my media advisor, being the very loyal, dedicated person that she is, um, said, why don't you do a profile of Lindsay? And the answer was, Lindsay's too normal. 
Now, when I heard this subsequently, I wasn't sure whether it was meant to be a compliment or an insult. <laughs> so I had very mixed feelings about uh, discovering that I was too normal to be the subject of a major profile at Good Weekend. But uh, unfortunately, by that stage, I was already had the finish line in mind, so I wasn't that upset. But I thought to myself, well, this really tells you what you need to know here, that basically these days to get on in Australian politics, more and more, you've actually got to put on a freak show. Uh, and that's, that's essentially where it's heading. Kim Beasley, when he lost the leadership to Kevin Rudd, you might recall that one of the signal events was a press conference where he was expressing condolences to Rove McManus because of the death of Belinda Emmett, his partner, and he jumbled it up and expressed his condolences to Carl Rove, who of course was uh, the political uh, sidekick of George Bush. And this was a, a signal event that led to Beasley's demise. Nobody asked the question, why on earth was Kim Beasley talking about Rove McManus and Belinda Emmett? Well, neither of them had anything to do with Australian politics. They're um, completely uh, unrelated. What he was trying to do, of course, was insert himself into the daily media cycle. So what he was, what he was trying to do, and, and that's what politicians more and more have to do, is if there's minimal coverage on the serious stuff, well, they have to go where the, the light stuff, the entertainment, uh, the, the sporting stuff, they have to go there. And that's why you know, I went on the footy show um, a year or so ago. And uh, that's why you've had... Uh, uh, are you smarter than the fifth grader? Talking about my generation, good news week. There's this plethora of senior politicians turning up on these light entertainment shows. Because what they're doing is seeking out the oxygen of publicity, which is getting harder and harder to get for serious things. So they're going where the media are. On a slightly more serious note, as, a, as an example, my colleague and friend Nick Sherry uh, was the subject of an article in the Business Age, and I presume it was probably in the Business Herald as well, uh, a year or so ago, that uh, was full of shock horror flavour. Nick Sherry, Assistant Treasurer, dined with executives of Macquarie Bank a week before the government decided to give the bank guarantees at the height of the global financial crisis. Macquarie Bank were significant beneficiaries of these guarantees, along with many other financial institutions, and although no specific allegation was made, the tone of the article was very clear. Funny business going on here. All very dodgy, you know, all very incestuous. This government minister who's in bed with Macquarie Bank, you know, isn't it terrible? Overlooked a few key facts. One, Nick Sherry was not a member of Cabinet. Two, he was not party to the decision to uh, introduced those bank guarantees and would not have known about the decision until the decision was announced. Three, those kind of dinners and lunches, whether you like it or not, are routine for government ministers and not just with people like Macquarie Bank, but all kinds of different organisations. And yet you get this, what I consider to be a significant slur on the character of a guy who's as straight as a die and very knowledgeable about uh, financial matters, very knowledge about superannuation and so on, and uh, all to create something titillating and exciting and interesting in passing as business news. The media reaction to my book has been very interesting. Uh, very interesting. There have been some, like George Megalogenis, uh, Barry Cassidy, Michelle Grattan, who have responded seriously and have kind of not necessarily signed up to my argument, but basically said, yeah, look, there's an issue here, and let's forget about who's really to blame, is it politicians, the media, whatever, there's an issue, we need to talk about it. But by and large, it's been one of incomprehension. The kind of who, us, what are you talking about, kind of thing. So uh, the content of the response has inclu included issues like my appearance, the school I attended, my performance as finance minister, my life after politics, and my reasons for resigning. Now, think for a second, none of them are at all relevant to the merits of my argument. They're entirely irrelevant. You, know, you may like or dislike my widow's peak, but let me tell you, it's not relevant to the question of whether my sideshow argument is right. The interesting thing so far is that nobody has really joined battle and said, 
the phenomenon I have described is not happening. Nobody has actually confronted the core thesis of the book and said, no, you were wrong. This is, the situation is no worse than it's ever been, or you've simply got it wrong. Uh, it's, it's all very different. Nobody, as far as I've seen so far, has done that. The main reaction from the doubters has been, well, it's not our fault, it's all the politicians' fault. You know, we're just the messengers, all that kind of stuff. Nobody has joined battle and said, no, this is not correct. The initial tabloid media coverage was sensational. It was almost like I paid somebody to give living proof to the thesis. <laughs> so we had Samantha May to do this article which got published in most of the Murdoch Sunday tabloids under titles like Tanner, Tanner Savage's Leaders and all this kind of stuff and had very carefully extracted, surgically removed little snippets that just happened to contain key words like Kevin Rudd and <laughs> Julia Gillard, uh, and presented as me attacking them and criticising them, when in fact, of course, the complete opposite was the case. And they were, in, in effect, innocent bystanders in those little things, and these are just mentions, and the critique is of the media. So uh, the, the great thing, of course, was that this is precisely what I predicted would happen in the book's introduction, where I said, well, this is how journalists are going to respond to my book. And <laughs> Samantha Maiden stepped up to the plate fantastically. <laughs> the funny thing is, though, that I then got criticised by columnists in the Australian, uh, Peter Van Onselen and Chris Kenny, for not attacking my former colleagues. So within the space of a week, I'm being criticised for attacking them and for not attacking them. Uh, of course, they felt that I would have written a much better book if I'd spilled the beans on the Labor government. I can understand where they're coming from, but that's not the book I set to write out, uh, to set out to write. Uh, even the 7:30 report, uh, which normally is a, an excellent program, had as its introductory trailer to the interview I did with Lee Sales the words Lindsay Tanner, or something like this: Lindsay Tanner shows or tells us, "quote What's wrong with Australian politicians?" Uh, no, actually, that's not the point of my book, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Um, the Sunday Telegraph in an editorial described me as a man who makes no secret of his bitterness. <laughs> Why didn't my friends tell me? <laughs> it's, it's kind of like you know, having a bad breath or something like that. Uh, uh, and of course, they produced absolutely no evidence to demonstrate that this was the case. Uh, that's a bit beside the point. Um, uh, I had uh, one of my other favourites was uh, speculation that the reason I left politics was in protest at Kevin Rudd's decision to walk away from the carbon pollution reduction scheme. Now, I think, I can't be certain of this, but I think if that were true, that would make me the first person in Australian political history to resign in protest about something but not tell anybody about it. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that kind of seems a bit contradictory to the notion of what the verb to protest actually means. <laughs> this didn't stop Peter Van Onselen from speculating that that may have been the real reason. Of course, the notion that uh, I left because of my family commitments was far too normal uh, to be uh, kind of absorbed and understood by some. Uh, David Pemberthy, in a review in The Australian, uh, uh, described me as uh, 50 going on 75, and that the basic problem here is that I was not much fun. Uh, um, I hope that Rupert Murdoch is prepared to overlook this slight on his sense of fun, given that he is actually somewhere around the 75 mark. Um, clearly, in the global financial crisis, what we were really missing was a finance minister who could tell better jokes, but uh, I, did, I did my best, I can assure you. Um, so, this is the kind of stuff that you know, reeks with literally just incomprehension, defensiveness, understandable, but just actually some of these people, they just don't get it. They are so accustomed to playing the man, not the ball. They're so accustomed to reporting the sport and the entertainment of politics and to pumping that up and to just ignoring or downplaying the serious content that actually affects people's lives and the future of the country, that they kind of have lost sight of the serious content. It's almost as if they, it's not so much they're in, any longer making a conscious choice, they have become so ingrained into a kind of today, tonight, a current affair way of looking at the world, they've lost sight of the fact that there actually is serious content. And I think that's a huge problem. Their misuse of language is, 
I think, a dreadful problem. One of the things that's occurred in two articles in response to my book that really makes me annoyed, and it's not annoyed personally because I'm not directed at me, I pointed out that Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan announced a business advisory council in opposition in mid-07, chaired by Sir Rod Eddington, and it actually never eventuated. Why? Because as time unfolded, it just got a bit hard and a bit complicated. And once we're in government, questions of, well, if you put this person on, how can you avoid putting that person on, and all these other things, and it ended up being abandoned. Uh, and I pointed out that the media were happy to uh, sort of report the announcement, but nobody actually noticed that it didn't happen. Uh, nobody, nobody really noticed that this had not been followed through on. Now, this has been re referred to by Sam Maiden as Kevin Rudd's deception, and uh, David Penberthy asserts that I have owned up to the fact that the government lied about this. Now, call me sort of old-fashioned and pedantic, but my definition of lying is making a statement you know is untrue. Changing your mind is actually something a bit different from lying. But here we have one of many examples where politicians are basically put in this position to say, well, something different has happened from what you said 12 months ago or whenever, therefore you have told the lie. When in fact there's absolutely no evidence of that, and in this instance, as in many others, it's completely incorrect. So I want to just finish with a couple of more recent examples that I think are useful to illustrate the points. The Senator David Bushby famous meow to Penny Wong the other day. Uh, now, the Herald Sun wrote an editorial saying that this demonstrated that I was wrong, that it's all politicians' fault, you know, all this infantile behaviour. We just kind of report what goes on. Um, well, I hate to disillusion them, but how do we answer these questions? Why is it that one or two minutes of Dozens of hours of Senate estimates hearings on all kinds of things, one or two minutes gets elevated and pushed onto the front page and uh, gets huge coverage. Who decided that? Was it Penny Wong? Don't think so. Was it David Bushby? I don't think so. Was it Julie Gillard? Gillard? No, I don't think so. Who decided to give huge attention and coverage? <coughs> Who put microphones under many politicians' noses and said, uh, if you'd like to be in the media, if you'd like people to know you exist, we want to comment on this matter. Ah, that'd be the media. Not politicians <coughs> making those calls. Yes, politicians do silly things. David Bushby did something silly there. You know, one isolated incident, one or one specific incident in hours and hours of hearings about all kinds of serious and sometimes not so serious issues. It's not the politicians who choose that to be the main content. It is the media who say, that's exciting, that's titillating, that involves conflict, we'll run that. And similarly, I was amazed to see the ABC, ABC News in my state, it probably wouldn't have registered much up here, uh, run a huge news item early on the news with about five different politicians giving grabs about Deputy Premier Louise Asher missing a division, a totally inconsequential division because she was asleep in her office at 11 o'clock at night. This was a big news item, got lots of coverage everywhere, and the opposition presented her with an alarm clock <coughs> in Parliament the following day. Now, here's my final rhetorical question. Why do you reckon the opposition presented her with an alarm clock? I think because they realised that that would probably get covered by the media, and that all kinds of serious things that they might have been doing on that day probably weren't going to get covered by the media. So these are just yet further illustrations of what I think is really a serious sickness at the heart of our democratic process. Flim flam, theatre, posturing, personalities, they've always been part of politics. And up to a point, they actually can play a positive role of lightening things up a bit, of making politics a bit more accessible and a bit more interesting. My concern though is that those things have taken over and that what is now happening is actually undermining our sense of a, a functioning democracy because we are heading to a world where literally the question of who governs Australia will be decided on matters such as whether Julia Gillard cried or not and what Tony Abbott looks like in speedos. Thank you very much.
have about 20 minutes for questions, so if you could um, put your arms up and then we'll take questions for Lindsay. First one, blue here. Gentleman there. Um, uh, thanks, Lindsay. Um, you talked here. Um, yeah, um, if you could speak up so we can yeah. all hear. Uh, you talked at sort of great length and given lots of examples of politicians, uh, the change in nature of politicians responding to the sort of change in nature of the, the media. Well, I, I think, um, yeah, and I believe that's true. I think um, the, the natural question that follows is then, why has the media changed? And I was, uh, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. But there's, this is actually dealt with in the latter part of my book, which hasn't got a huge amount of coverage because it's a little bit, to be honest, a bit obscure and a bit reflective. Uh, I think the main answer is technological change and intensifying competition. And so the leeway that a lot of the commercial media used to have to be vaguely high-minded and public-spirited has got squeezed. Uh, so an example I cited, which I've never forgotten, is years ago the guy who runs Channel 9 Current Affairs, uh, News and Current Affairs, said to me after I'd given him the rounds of the kitchen about why is a current affair such a load of rubbish? Um, you know, why do we have this endlessly recycled, you know, the tenant from hell, the evil bureaucrat from the local council, the con man in the car yard? Those of you who still watch it when I'm talking about it. Um, his answer was, every time we have a politician on a current affair, 100,000 people change the channel. And I kind of went, um, uh, ooh, I think I just lost the argument there. Um, because these are commercial organisations. So, uh, you know, in a sense, I think that's a reasonable response. That uh, I think it's true to say that politicians could lift their game a bit, even though they're responding to external pressures. And it's equally true to say the media could lift its game a bit, but we shouldn't forget those external pressures. And behind all of that is, I think, enormous complacency in this country, which is, to a large degree, a product, a product of 20 years of no serious economic downturns. But there's a whole lot of complicated things in there which really are the subject for another, another book or somebody's PhD or whatever. But uh, I think that's a real problem. One of the reasons why political debate was very highly charged and very serious and quite accessible in the 1980s, and why you had so many big serious reforms that were often quite unpopular through, was there was a widespread community unease about the state of Australia, about the state of the economy, and about our position in the world. So people were up for a bit of a serious discussion. Uh, I think we've been in a, an era recently which has been very different. So that you know, everybody's in the picture to some degree. Uh, lady over there on the left. Uh, <coughs> you talked about just now the commercial imperative and also in the book a bit about the psychological reasons why people disengage from politics and focus on the trivial. So how do we fix it? Yeah, well, <laughs> look, I, one of the things the book has been criticised for, I think, not unreasonably, is not enough solutions. Uh, so I do explore some of the possible things. I think there are some modest things that governments could do. I'm a huge fan of community broadcasting, for example. I think community radio is a much undervalued asset. I think radio generally is a bit of the hope of the side here. Commercial radio just as much as the ABC and community radio. So uh, just as one small thing, the government putting in more than six or seven million bucks a year into community radio, I think will be a significant positive, but you know, it's not a magic bullet or anything like that. Um, but naturally, because you're ultimately dealing here with issues of freedom of speech, we need to be very careful about any serious government intervention. There are countries in Europe where governments subsidise uh, newspapers and stuff like that, partly for this kind of reason, to guarantee that there uh, remains a kind of reasonable public discussion about more serious issues. Um, I think it would be pretty unlikely that people would cop that in Australia. I think there are legitimate reasons why they'd be very uh, doubtful about it. I'm hopeful that, uh, believe it or not, that market forces are already starting to push back a bit. I believe that the big swing to the Greens in the last election, which of course, amongst other things, gave them my old electorate, uh, was, uh, was largely driven by more politically aware, educated voters saying we are sick of being talked to as if we were children. Um, and although we don't necessarily sign up to all the Greens policies and some of them are wacky or whatever, at least they talk about serious things. Now that's my interpretation, I can't prove it, others will have different opinions, but I think there, there is a bit of a, an initial trend pushing back. And 
I'm hopeful that my book makes a bit of a contribution to that. It just makes a lot of people a, a little bit more aware of it and therefore maybe just go that extra 5%, which in aggregate might make a difference. But it, it is a, a very difficult sort of puzzling thing. There's no simple way of you know, sort of say, prodding people in the chest and saying, you know, this is serious, you idiots, stop playing around. You just can't do it. You're, you're dealing with you know, millions of people who will, if they want to switch off, they'll switch off. Gentlemen over here. Um, in your book, you talk very slightly about new media and new media that was like the right of news or the right of science book. And you dismiss them because they're not mainstream media. But at the same time, you, you, you seem to ignore that the parties themselves had more control over the message that they could convey out to the public. And so when interested people were looking for information, they'd go to like the Liberal Party website or the Labour Party website or the Greens Party website. And just there was a vacuity, that, like there was no policy sort of really being put forward. How much can you blame the media for not reporting on policy when the policy wasn't there in the first place? Um, well, there is inevitably a, a chicken and egg question here. You know, I'm putting forward my view, but it's not a physics experiment, so I can't prove that you know, my perspective on it is, is literally true. Uh, I would suggest to you it's not a coincidence that there's uh, an increasing dearth of detailed policy being put out. Uh, I would suggest to you that the, the, the primary reason for that is that the only time that kind of thing ever gets reported and, and talk to the Greens about this, the only time that kind of thing gets reported is some kind of shock, horror, tabloid, you know, Greens uh, want to make drugs compulsory kind of story. <laughs> um, you know, that, uh, that's the only time that kind of stuff gets reported. So guess what? Political parties go, I don't think we'll go there anymore. Um, now, like I said, you can, you know, people have different views about that. I think that's, that's an unfortunate thing. But there are other factors in play too. The world has got so much more complex than it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and therefore it's becoming harder and harder to go through the processes I did many years ago of being part of policy formulation processes where you might be, in effect, making calls today about something that might happen in five years' time or something like that. That's getting harder and harder because the world is changing so rapidly and it's becoming so much more complex. So there's a lot of other factors in play uh, there. Um, but, but I can't say that I have much of a look at the various websites at the last election, but I'm prepared to accept your comment as probably true. Um, <coughs> gentlemen, the white men is over there right next. Uh, you talked about the need for politicians, civilian media, their oxygen. Uh, are there any instances you can share of like where the horror story came through the media said, we really don't like you, even if you kill a guy, we're not going to mention you at all. Has that ever happened? Um, look, I, off the top of my head, I don't think so. I don't think that, you know, the, this is the thing is that there, there, are no, there are no conspiracies here, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, the media are internally pretty competitive, so um, it's, it's not reasonable to suggest, for example, that, you know, the, the Fin Review and the Australian and the Herald and the Age and the Herald Sun and the Daily Telegraph all get together and say, right, it's all agreed, we're not going to give any coverage to person X. Clearly that kind of thing doesn't happen. So I, I don't think I can think of any example of that kind. Uh, I, I think in a sense, um, the, you know, it's, it's not so much that there is a conscious decision saying, you know, this person is too boring, we're not covering them. Uh, it is more that that's what happens by default. <coughs> One of the things I mentioned in my book is that um, the adjective I attracted more than any other during my political career was the word thoughtful. Now, <laughs> most of you, I hope, think that's a compliment. Uh, unfortunately, it's a journalist word that means boring. <laughs> there are other journalist words like maverick, which means delivers good copy, a la Marvin Joyce. Uh, charismatic, which means sells newspapers. Uh, so, uh, words sort of sometimes mean a little bit different from what you and I think they mean. Uh, but I don't as much doubt that uh, you've got to be more and more of a crowd-pleasing show pony uh, to, um, to, to at least be in the, the top echelon those days. Who's the gentleman over there? With the beard, one of the um, How much 
do you think is um, back the other way from politicians, especially in terms of of the um, two-party system and um, that uh, uh, individual MPs don't need to articulate their views on issues. They can hide behind the, the party lines. And in terms of the Labor Party, that's enforced. Yeah. Um, look, the, the starting point is there's no perfect system. So whatever kind of arrangements you've got, uh, we do pretty well in this country. I can point to deficiencies in the constitutional arrangements. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of state governments and so forth, but I think by and large, um, <laughs> by and large, we we do okay. But it's really important in criticising these things to remember that you know that most of the time you change things, you're kind of swapping one set of anomalies or problems for another set. Uh, so that is a as a preliminary thing. Um, I'm a bit of a fan of party discipline and uh, and clear collective groups of MPs for a simple reason, that is consumer awareness, for want of a better term. Uh, for all of the crap that is written and spoken about independence and consciences and all this other stuff, the truth is that no matter how engaged and interested the election the electorate is going to be, of the hundred thousand odd people who are electing an individual MP, a very large proportion of those people who vote for that person who's successful know one crucial thing about that person only. That is their party affiliation. And through that knowledge, a whole range of other knowledge comes to them about roughly how this person might behave as their representative. It's not perfect, but at least it gives them some information about the product they're buying. If somebody votes for me because of my conscience, I could do anything. They've got no idea about what I might then do as their representative. Whereas the reason I was elected six times was because I had the words Australian and Labor Party after my name in the ballot paper. And however great I might think I am, there is no doubt that the vast bulk of the people who were voting for me were actually voting because they wanted a Labor member of Parliament and they wanted a Labor government. So to me, although political parties can misbehave, they can get a bit too uh, prescriptive or a bit too paranoid about the message, and, and I'd like to see a loosening of that, I confess. But uh, I, I'd urge people not to be drawn in by the the mirage of independence and you know, noble individuals and so forth, because the truth is that where that takes you is, uh, I think, ultimately less representative and less democratic. Let in the rest. It's probably fair to say that Kevin Dine had a particular knack for feeding the beast. Um, and when Julia Gillard became Prime Minister, I think she was really clear in terms of um, feeding the beast less and wanting to, um, you know, she's done less press conferences, that sort of thing. Do you think there's any chance for reform of the beast um, in the longer term? And just a quick second question. Newspapers are increasingly going behind paywalls. Do you think that would change the trend at all? The paywalls one's a very interesting question. I think there's an awful lot of people out there who would love to know the answer to that because they'd make large amounts of money betting either way. Uh, I don't know the answer to it, but you're dead right that that's a, uh, I think a very significant swing or potential swing factor. Uh, and look, I, I don't think there's going to be any individual or sudden change of behaviour or whatever that's going to solve those problems. I think really a bit of more community awareness, a bit more pressure from the consumers, which as I said, I think we've seen initial signs of, will help to change things. Also events. You know, we've been very fortunate for 20 years, no serious economic downturns. We broadly managed to miss the worst of the global financial crisis. There was no guarantee that circumstances will be as benign in the next five years or whatever. So clearly if circumstances change, that can change the mood. The, the new media angle is quite interesting, I think, because uh, and I'm, to be honest, I'm a bit ambivalent. You can look at the new media thing and say, look, the problem is that uh, you are not going to get the equivalent of a mass media most people in the community are connected to a conversation <coughs> out of the new media. Uh, and I, 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 I kind of suspect that's right because you've got all these fantastic niche products that people who are already engaged, already aware and interested, 
gravitate to, but they tend to be relatively modestly sized minorities. And you've got things like Twitter, which are great for kind of gossip and scuttlebutt and one-off little occurrences, but not exactly the appropriate location for a serious political debate about an issue. Um, so it's, and, and of course, we don't know what new technological advances are going to flow as well. So I'm, I think the jury's still out about all these things, but th there's a fantastic uh, book by a guy called Marcus Pryor, who was a researcher in the US that I drew on for a few pages, uh, talking about American television in the 50s and 60s. And his argument is that because everybody watched TV and because they had all the stations with their news is on at the same time and, and a large number of people basically watch whatever was on and because there was a, a degree of public service obligation to have vaguely serious news, what that meant was that a whole lot of people who normally would opt not to plug in to serious news about politics did so and that you had this period because of the nature of the media in the US and the equivalent of Australia would be in the 60s and 70s that you had a higher than usual kind of mass connection with the world of politics. But what effectively happened in the US was the emergence of cable TV. Um, his argument was, to put it very succinctly, people didn't change, they just changed the channel. And so people who suddenly had entertainment options, they didn't have to watch the news, stop watching the news. So to me that's a, quite a telling thing about how the technologies do influence behaviour. But of course none of us can predict where the new media goes. I, I, I kind of, you know, I have different views on different days that sometimes I'm quite optimistic about it, other days I'm not. Time for one last question. <coughs> lady in the white, just here. Oh, lady up there, anyway. On the left hand side. Do I have a hand up? Oh, it's good, isn't it? Oh, it's the world's fastest sex change. <laughs> So uh, that is one area where 
I think it is possible to be a bit optimistic about the future, where uh, although it won't be uh, perhaps quite on the same mass scale, although who knows, uh, there are signs of a swing back with different kinds of organisations, get up being the, the obvious example. But in, in a sense, there's a, there's a very percipient point made by somebody who I can't remember one of the many books I read about all this stuff um, that helps to explain this problem, talking very much about the issue you've raised and pointing out that of all those intermediaries, the one that's left standing is the one that's driven by the profit motive. So that you have this array of intermediaries in the political space between the ordinary citizen and the politicians. Mm -hmm. The others, whether they be service clubs, trade unions, churches, whatever, are all actually service to their members driven. Whereas the one that's kind of ultimately prevailed, ultimately triumphed, is the one that's actually uh, commercially driven. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that, that is, I think, a significant element of trying to understand why we have got to where we are. And the bottom line is that we all want to be entertained. Not all of us want to be informed. So in a strict commercial frame, entertainment will always trump information. And, and that's a hard problem. And that is a human reality that I nobody thinks is going to change. So there's the dilemma, is that how do we somehow underneath that reality, just try and push the pendulum back a little bit so that information and serious discussion kind of gets a slightly bigger place in the sun than the place it currently has. I'm hopeful that, like I say, that just public demand, market forces, rising education levels will help to do that. But it is important that people here tonight, you know, if you think you're getting crap, don't put up with it. You know, try and express your view and try and, whether it's to the, the local paper or whether a politician or whatever, you know, even in small ways, it's amazing how much a few individuals can actually have an impact on those things. Thank you very much. My pleasure to just say a few words of thanks to Lindsay Tanner for that extraordinary talk. Uh, Lindsay is a great intellectual in politics and of course the role of intellectuals in politics has always been a bit contested. Uh, Lenin was never quite sure whether intellectuals should be uh, put with the, the good proletarians or put up against the wall with the bourgeoisie. Uh, William Buckley famously said that he'd rather be ruled by the first 2,000 names from the Boston phone book than by the entire faculty of Harvard University. <laughs> and, and, and when you think of the notion of a, an entire parliament of book writers, uh, I don't know about you, but it, it kind of makes me shudder a little. Uh, but parliament is clearly far better for Lindsay's nearly two decades in it, uh, and Australia is clearly the better for it as well. Like one of my hero, other heroes, uh, Ken Henry, Lindsay thinks about the world through systems and through incentives, not through thinking about individuals. Actually, now I think about it, um, there's a few similarities between, uh, between Lindsay and Ken Henry. I mean, they're both brilliant, very handsome, naturally, uh, a little gruffed voice. They don't suffer fools very easily, as you would have seen from Ken in Senate Estimates and uh, Lindsay on some of his recent TV interviews. Uh, they both give great speeches. Uh, Lindsay may not be a show pony, but uh, you certainly managed to please this crowd. Uh, and they did both resign in the middle of last year, which sort of brings me to a natural question. Uh, don't answer this if you've ever worked in Treasury, Finance or Parliament House, but has anyone actually seen Ken Henry and Lindsay Tanner in the same room together? <laughs> ah, didn't think so. Is Ken Henry it's here this point, evening? <laughs> Hands up for Ken Henry? No, all right. So please join me in thanking the, the Henry Tanner, I mean, here this evening in his Lindsay Tanner manifestation uh, for a greatly engaging and stimulating conversation uh, and one that hopefully all of us can take on board to go out there and uh, tackle the problems that Lindsay's identified. Thank you.